I'm Glenn McGuinness, and this is Outburst. On the program, should unvaccinated Canadians face further COVID-19 restrictions? People should be required to be vaccinated. No, I don't think so. There are a small minority that have a right not to be vaccinated. I really struggle with people who choose not to get vaccinated. But first, we've heard the talk about supply chain issues and how they affect businesses. Many Canadians have witnessed firsthand how grocery stores across the country have their shelves more empty than usual. We took to the streets to ask Canadians what can be done about this issue before it gets worse. Our question. What should the federal government do to resolve supply chain issues? So I think to be fair to the federal government, it's a, it's a worldwide issue. So uh, obviously supply chain has been heavily affected by COVID. So I think once COVID is resolved, the supply chain issues will resolve. But at the same time, they should look at port congestion and uh, the ability to move product from ports across the, the country. Yes, there are some issues with supply chain, but I feel that a lot of it has actually been overblown. And as an Albertan, I feel that specifically in Alberta has been used as a bit of a political hot potato to say, oh, look, everything's horrible and, and that kind of thing. And, and yet it actually hasn't been that bad. I think you have to be a little bit creative about finding certain things, but um, or be a bit more patient or you can't always get the exact one product that you want. But honestly, it's not like the grocery shelves are bare and they're not. I think they're working on it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'll leave it up to the experts. But uh, that's the role of government to come up with solutions. Well, it, it seems to be a global thing. So I really, I really don't know uh, if, the, if the federal government can really do a whole lot about it. I would just say uh, don't panic too much and uh, hope things kind of work out as, uh, as we kind of come out of COVID. Consider the stakeholders that are impacted by that and ask them for what their insights are because I would imagine they probably have a better idea of the logistics and everything that goes into that. Right now with the uh, vaccination requirements for the truckers, I think they should uh, do something about that definitely. Right, straight now one out. That's a big, big problem. Supply chain. A lot of it is, I, I think some of it's out of the government's control, but you know, they definitely need to look at things that'll make things easier for people to get their goods across the border. People should buy locally. I mean, I come to the farmer's market, there's plenty of fresh produce, there's no empty shelves. Buy local. I was having the same issue with meat, like it was, it was non-stop. So what do I do? I have to find an alternative way to like, you know, eat like tofu, more vegetables and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not good. Well, it's all about supply and demand, right? So if you don't have that product on the shelf, there's got to be a reason why. So it could be because um, it's a trucker thing, right? There's no deliveries. Um, I'm more concerned, to be honest with you, about retail stores that don't have products and have nothing on the shelves that it's small mom and pop stores that they don't have anything. So I think we should be worried about them and not big box stores. I'm not gonna lie, the shelves are pretty, they're pretty empty right now. Um, people don't have a lot of patience waiting in the long lines right now. Um, it gets a bit hectic sometimes. What do you think we should do about that? Add more staff. I feel like these businesses need to reinstate their staff. Um, you know, people need the money right now and they need to work. And uh, for the beneficial of the public, we should have more staff on hand. I haven't had any trouble. I've seen less, but it's not caused me any real troubles. For those people that are having that problem and not being able to get things, what do you think the federal government should do about it? Well, I like the idea of the trucks, truckers doing their protests and uh, hopefully they just continue doing their jobs and uh, How are you? we all just do the best we can until it gets back to better than normal. I've never been to a store yet that I wanted something and it wasn't there. So I think the, the stores are doing okay. I think they can um, increase the minimum wage so, to support the um, the 
people who work uh, for minimum wage and so that um, they will be able to make a decent income so that they will want to uh, work at grocery stores and things like that. I think there's two aspects to the problem. One is relates to the uh, supply chains and one relates to the safety of the grocery store workers. Uh, with respect to the requirement for vaccination, I, I personally I, I support it. And uh, uh, but for uh, for uh, uh, grocery store workers, I, I think that uh, uh, you know they could increase their wages. Uh, there has been absenteeism, and uh, but there's also been a lot of illness too. I think at the benefit of what, at the cost of what, you know, and right now when, when you have people that aren't involved in that suffering, getting their rations and whatnot, it's kind of, you know, I think it loses part of the support that you could put into it, you know? I think they can increase like uh, the traffic, you know what I mean, for the food right now? Because I mean, doing this to the truckers, they're the one bringing the food in, right? So if they can't get across the border or bring merchandise anywhere, they can't do their job which means a shortage in the groceries. So they could do something about it right now instead of letting this keep on going because clearly there has to be a change that has to be done. So because people got to eat, right? Everybody's got to eat. So I think I think like if they allow them to, to do their thing again, to work, like go across the border and all over, I think the food is going to come back up. You know what I mean? Tension on the Russia-Ukraine border has garnered the attention of NATO allies and the world. For Canada, helping Ukraine is certainly a priority, but what that help should be would depend on who you ask. Canada has not committed to sending troops at this point, but they are helping with training troops in Ukraine, as well as offering the country a $120 million loan. But are we doing enough? Our question. How should Canada respond to the crisis in Ukraine? Stay out of it. That's my response. Um, don't get involved unless you really have to. Um, there are different stories from both sides of the situation, multiple sides and multiple perspectives. Um, as a Ukrainian immigrant, um, I consider myself more Canadian, but I'm providing context so that I'm looking at the situation objectively. and. You know, Canada has always been a peaceful country, and I would like to see uh, Canada continue uh, being a peaceful country. And we don't know the entire story between Ukraine and Russia. There are multiple stories to the same situation, and media portrays uh, different propaganda from their own points of views. Um, I, my suggestion would be you know, get involved if you really have to, but at the end of the day, it's uh, a situation between Russia and Ukraine, something that they could resolve without getting other countries involved. And if we can, you know, reduce the involvement from other countries, the better it is. We don't want another World War III, please. <laughs> As a former vet of the Canadian military, uh, basically, I think they should... We had enough wars all over the world with Canadians, Americans all need to allies. We basically getting killed and coming back home to the family. I think they should just try to do it in a more diplomatic way instead of sending military presence uh, to start another war, which in it can be bad. So my take on it, it should be done more diplomatically. Interfering in a Russian-Ukrainian dispute, I don't think Canada's involvement is necessary now. Um, you know, we could provide some sort of aid if that was necessary, but as far as a military action or something, no, I don't believe we should be involved in that. I think if we have the means to support someone who's in need and, and the power is completely imbalanced, I think we need to, to use our resources. You know, if we're a privileged country, we need to support people who, aren't, who don't have the power. Canada should support uh, the t Ukrainian troops uh, who are uh, protecting their own country, but should not uh, provide our own troops to uh, involve ourselves in that conflict in that way. Uh, I think they should help Ukraine because I think what they're doing to Russia is not okay. That's injustice. You can't just go into somebody's home and tell them, get out. This is our property now. That's not fair at all.
That's cruel. You know what I mean? Imagine you're sitting in the comfort of your own place. You're watching whatever news, Netflix, or whatever you're doing. Somebody comes in your house say, get out. All your stuff is mine too. That's not right. How would you feel? Right? That's how I see it. So, so uh, I mean, so what should Canada do? They should help Ukraine out. They shouldn't let the Russia, you know, like, uh, come, come in and invade Ukraine. But uh, I think they've been helping Ukraine. They sent 120 million recently. So that's very good. That's very good, actually. Because um, obviously it's not right what Russia is doing. I mean, this is the world we live in today, right? Injustice is everywhere, left and right. Well, I think we're doing about the right thing now. We don't need to do any more, I don't think. No. Why do you say that? Well, it, it, there's a lot of players involved here. And uh, we don't want to get too aggressive with Russia. And so I think we'll just stay steady as she goes. But you, you cannot have a country just decide they're going to invade another country and let that go. You ha there has to be some response. I'm not sure negotiations, sanctions, just the threat of another army being there. But you can't just let that go because basically if all you do is hold back and hold back, it just emboldens the more authoritarian countries to do what they want. I think any solution there is going to be diplomatic. I think, uh, you know, really kind of ratcheting up military tensions, I don't, I don't think is, uh, it's really going to be good for the situation over there. Um, I would say keep, keep with the path of diplomacy and uh, don't, uh, don't escalate things militarily through either rhetoric or, uh, or arms sales. I think it's a, it's a question because obviously uh, Ukraine is special for Canada because there's a lot of people with Ukrainian heritage. Uh, but at the same time, what we should always consider is um, what's in Canadians' national interests. And hopefully uh, we don't want to get dragged into a European war. And I think the Europeans need to step up and manage things in their own backyard. At the same time, I also know that we as a country are not a military power by any stretch of the imagination. And so there's limitations on what we can do effectively. But I do think that we need to do more than go, yes, we stand with Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and that may require a more significant engagement than we are currently doing and actually put some teeth behind the rhetoric. Um, as much as I hate the idea of getting involved in conflict, um, this is not a, uh, yeah, I can't help but see some serious parallels to 1938, Czechoslovakia, and, um, and is appeasement really the wise choice when you have a very aggressive um, leader who is threatening the sovereignty of another nation? Well, I think they should definitely uh, put a front up, like against it, right? The, you know, the you know the imminent maybe invasion from Russia. You know, it's always never good when somebody tries to take over another country. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're part of NATO, so work with the NATO alliance and and do what what the rest of the group thinks. I think they still have to be negotiating. Um, yeah, I think they still need to negotiate, uh, see both sides, and uh, uh, hopefully smart people will uh, come up with a solution. When was the first black Canadian elected to the House of Commons? Was it 1940? 1957 or 1968? The answer, 1968. Lincoln Alexander was elected in Hamilton West as a progressive conservative in 1968, becoming Canada's first black MP. In 1979, he would also become the first black Canadian in a federal cabinet as labor minister in Joe Clark's short-lived minority government. Alexander also served as Ontario's Lieutenant Governor from 1985 to 1991, again acting as a trailblazer for black Canadians. Nowadays, many of us do our banking, shopping, and even socializing online. But the threat of our personal information falling into the wrong hands has many people concerned. We took to the streets to ask Canadians if they feel their online information is secure and safe. Our question. Do you feel your digital information is safe and secure? As much as possible. We have to, you have to keep, uh, you know, changing passwords, doing things to make sure it's secure. You're always aware that there's a risk. 
but it is it is such a convenience that it is uh, very hard not to use the service. Yeah. And, and at this time, we haven't had any problems, and I hope they stay that way. But we watch our our, our internet and so on pretty pretty closely. Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't keep money in my bank. I just keep all cash stashed away. Um, if I need to pay my bills, I pay my bills. That's it. That's, that's Besides that, no cash in the bank. I, I keep all cash liquid, you know what I mean? I think so. Uh, I don't know. I just, I hope so. I, 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 I can imagine it wouldn't be too difficult to make it unsafe, but... I don't know, with everything at your fingertips, I, th I think that, uh, well, I, I, again, I hope that it's safe. I haven't had any fraudulent behavior on my side of things, so. I think there is a level of insecurity about anything, any any kind of uh, endeavor, any, any living in society that you have to do, you give up some of your security uh, for the sake of getting things done, right? But at the same time, I don't think that Everything is secure in any sense of the word. I think there are many um, vulnerabilities uh, online. So you always you know, have a sense of, of uh, caution when doing things online. So don't think um, there's any such thing as per perfect security. Uh, it's hard to say. I, I'd probably say no. Um, just given our, our kind of world is on the phone now and it just comes down to who has access to it. And like a lot of these social media companies we're aware of, um, have access to everything. So do I think it's secure? No, but sometimes um, it also comes down to the person and, and I guess companies are getting better at, you know, you can you have the option now on Apple phones to, you know, uh, pick whether or not you want to give your information away to like certain apps and whatnot. So it's getting better, but I don't think it's completely there yet. I don't know. I mean, I have been in Canada for two years now and there is a lot of digital information. I think in general, all the government um, websites were really okay uh, I'm not afraid of putting like information like uh, about myself on those uh, websites for like health system or stuff like that so no I don't think my digital information is safe and secure and I think from a uh, pandemic response a lot of hesitancy at the start was people worried about what happens to their medical records online etc so Generally speaking, no, I don't feel confident at all about uh, digital privacy. Uh, not really. <laughs> um, I think, well, I mean, I'm not a millennial, so I don't post a lot of stuff online or Twitter or post everything that I do. I just don't think, I don't think it's safe. I think there's too much that people can look up about you now. Every time that we engage with a free product online, or service online, we are giving our, like that's not free, we're giving our information in exchange for whatever service is being provided. Like we're giving our information to Facebook, we're giving our information to Twitter, we're giving our information to YouTube, we're giving our information to um, all sorts of other products and they are gathering that and we sign those contracts and I think that that is terrifying. Um, well, I have very secure passwords. I make them very complicated and I don't share them with anyone. I'm very hesitant about giving my information out to um, people. Um, I really ask, is it necessary? And just try to understand like what's the, what are the risks with me giving my information out? Everybody from, from Google to the government probably has a pretty good idea what my, my search history is at this point. <laughs> So, uh, hey, I'm an open book, though, so. I just feel like um, we're kind of being tracked. Just like when I talk about something, you'll see it on my algorithm. It just comes out without even me searching it. I would hope so, yeah. Do I think it is? Um, no. I would say there's potential for harm, for people to infiltrate your phone, yes. Not totally, because so many people have access to our information these days. Nothing is safe anymore online, in my opinion. No. Why not? Um, because I, I just don't think it is. I've, there's been so many people compromised, and I have been many times. I don't want to be naive, I guess, about it. Let's say, for example, I have like um, an idea, right? Oh, I wanted to buy like a new pair of shoes. I don't know how they kind of like simultaneously predicted that I wanted shoes. Like the advertising company are just geniuses. So they kind of know what I already want before I want it, which is scary. Yeah, so it's like, 
they're in my head and they're in my, you know, they control in my mind? Uh, not necessarily. I feel like sometimes our cell phones are tapped and anybody at any time can turn on the camera or listen on to our conversation. So sometimes I don't feel like it's completely secure. <laughs> The debate over vaccine mandates has created a division in this country which seems to expand as the days and weeks go by and which these trucker protests have clearly shown us. While many Canadians continue to follow public health directives, others do not and likely won't in the foreseeable future. So we took our cameras out to ask Canadians whether or not those who refuse to get their jabs should be limited to where they can go and what they can do. Our question. Should unvaccinated Canadians face further COVID-19 restrictions? No, I don't think so. I think it's a choice. And if you want to be unvaccinated, I think that's your choice, just like any of the other vaccines. And I know that, I think because COVID's only been around for a very short time and they made this vaccine really quick, they don't know what the outcome is down the road. And if people choose not to get it, then that's their choice. And if you do choose to get it, also your choice and I don't think that you should have any other restrictions regardless. Well I myself am vaccinated because I want to do things and so I am not restricted but um, if it means to uh, being in a safer community then um, sure but I don't think that it should be forced upon them that's it yeah. No I don't think so no I think it's time to relook at that whole thing again too right you know yeah it's you know everybody has their choices and you know and I don't think there should be any more restrictions put on. There's enough already. Really, I mean, they've made the choice not to be, and frankly, they're more at risk. And so if that's a risk they're willing to take, I say let them. They should face restrictions. Um, because they're jeopardizing the lives of uh, others. It's a little selfish not being uh, vaccinated, but some people have special... Uh, reasons why they're not. I encourage everyone to be vaccinated if possible. I really struggle with people who choose not to get vaccinated because I see vaccination as being part of a social contract. Um, contract. We have rights and we have responsibilities and you cannot have rights without responsibilities. We have a response, my rights end at the beginning of somebody else's rights. And that's the point where we have responsibilities and we have responsibilities to the other people that we interact with. And when you are dealing with a global pandemic, that means one of your responsibilities is doing what you can um, in order to prevent that spread, in order to prevent others from being ill. And one of those responsibilities is actually getting vaccinated and doing the quite frankly bare minimum in order to prevent that spread. No, I, I don't because I, I think at the end of the day when it comes to something like a health service, the health service is for everyone. It's not just for the vaccinated and unvaccinated. And I think we're going to set a very dangerous precedent if you start to actually suggest if somebody doesn't have something, then they're going to be treated somewhere in a second class citizen. But I would say everybody has a responsibility to look after the wider society. And I think if you're unvaccinated, you should think about how you protect the rest of society and hopefully get vaccinated. I think so. You know, I've, we've all been given this opportunity to get vaccinated. It's free, it's no cost. I think unless there's a really good reason for an exemption, like a medical, like you're allergic to it, um, you should really be getting vaccinated. Um, I think we've catered to the unvaccinated in certain circumstances. So I would like to be catered to um, and being allowed to do more things because I am fully vaccinated and boosted. It depends. Some people will get angry and they'll say, I don't care. I don't have my shots. I still want to do what I want to do. Some people are like, I don't want my shots, but I'll still get my shots to protect others, but also protect myself. See, it's really a 50-50. You know what I mean? So uh, out of courtesy and like respect for others, maybe, yeah, you shouldn't do what you do if you don't have the vaccine, right? Because I mean, now the, the virus is in your body. You could be spreading it to everybody. We're vaccinated, and uh, I've had I've had three shots, and I've also caught COVID. So, <laughs> uh, so he's very very <laughs> safe right now. <laughs> so uh, I don't. Uh, I think for their own good, they should become vaccinated. 
That, that's, trust the science. But should they, should, should they face further restrictions? Oh, I, I, I can't say about if, that. If they're going to be out and among people, then yes. People should be required to be vaccinated um, to uh, involve themselves in things that are not essential to their health and wellness. Um, but I don't think that further restrictions are necessary aside from what we already have. In my opinion, I think if everybody kind of, you know, helped everybody, we could probably get ahead of this instead of staying behind it. No, not at all. And why is that? Because being uh, uh, vaccinated does not stop you from uh, spreading it and it does not stop you from being sick. It may lessen your sickness. And I think if they're allowing, if they want, it should be a choice. Right? It, people seeing what's going on, like people dying, people in the house, ICU and stuff like that. But for me, I was very hesitant myself to get it. But now I'm fully vaccinated and I want my kids to get it and my wife, but my wife is like totally against it. She's not doing it. So I'm just doing it for myself and my, to protect my kids. 100%. I mean, they're a bit of a risk to the the public safety, right? I mean, we're all doing our part as best as we can, and if they choose not to, you're risking not only your health, but the safety of others. I think unvaccinated people, they should have the right and the choice to either get vaccinated or not. I don't believe that we need to be forced, like the government is forcing individuals. If you don't get vaccinated, you get fired, for instance. And these are some extreme measures, but they are moving into that direction. And I think that's unfair for those who choose not to get vaccinated to put them against the wall and, and make them make a choice between how do I survive if I don't want to get vaccinated versus I'm going to get vaccinated, put my body at a risk that I don't feel comfortable putting in, even despite the evidence that is showing in the media. Um, I think Canada is a, a free country and um, uh, I immigrated here 25 years ago, and the reason why we came here is for those choices. I think that if they go to the hospital and they're not vaccinated, pay your own hospital bill. Why should us taxpayers that's going by the rules and regulations be penalized and have to pay for, for your care when you're stupid enough not to be vaccinated? No, like I don't think they should be terminated from their employment or withheld from a hospital? No, no. They, I say, they should make their own choice, and yeah, I do not think that they should be downgraded in any way. I think it's their choice to do whatever they want, but don't, don't, you know, press it upon upon us on what you think we ought to be doing. Like we're not, I'm not going to tell you to get vaxxed. Don't tell me to not get vaxxed. So if everybody stays in their own lane, I think we all should be good. Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGinnis, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.